I am the Dean of the University of San Diego's College of Arts and Sciences. And on behalf of USD, the college and the Humanities Center, um, I would like to welcome you to another USD Conversations panel, uh, the impact of misinformation on American democracy, past and present. Uh, USD Conversations is an ongoing program of our Humanities Center, and it's dedicated to sharing insights, building discussions, and creating connections with faculty, alumni, and, and all of our friends. Uh, central to both the humanities and the sciences um, are the search for truth. And we as individuals and communities cannot make informed, rational, and moral decisions without being able to discern fact from fiction and truth from falsehood. Um, giving our students the tools and knowledge to be able to engage in fact-based reasoning is central to USD's mission um, to advance academic excellence and to prepare all our students to be leaders who are dedicated to eth ethical conduct and com compassionate service. I know that we have a lot of our students in the audience here today, and I think that's very important. This mission has never never been so vital and so challenged. Every day, social media and the internet bombards us with mistruths, falsehoods, disinformation, and conspiracy theories of all kinds. Uh, whether unintentional or deliberate, this fire hose of falsehoods can, can overwhelm us, causing even the most cautious of us to be duped. So the College of Arts and Sciences is honored to bring a panel of nationally recognized scholars and journalists to lead us in the examination of the impact of fake news, misinformation, and conspiracy theories on American democracy past and present. So this is the first of two afternoon panels being held as part of the University of San Diego's and San Diego Community College's districts joint Institute for Civil Civic Engagements, ninth annual Restoring Respect Civility Conference. Uh, so please do join us for our second panel following this one at 2 p.m. If we were all together in person, we could all just wander down the hall, but now we just need you to, to link and collect on, click onto uh, Voting 2020, Fact versus Fiction, um, as our county registrar of voters in San Diego, uh, Michael Vu, uh, San Diego's League of Women Voters president, Lori Thiel, and UCSD political scientist, Dr. Thad Kauser, joins our, our own two at USD, Dr. Um, Evan Crawford, in looking at the process of voting in 2020. So you can register for, by, for the panel if you haven't done so. Um, already by going to um, san diego.edu slash events. So now it is my pleasure to turn our discussion over to our moderator, uh, Carolyn Kilbanoff. Carolyn is the program manager for Made by Us, leading the nationwide initiative from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. We're really pleased to have her with us today. Uh, Made by Us, it has a nine member steering committee of America's leading history institutions. And they bring together a coalition of more than 65 history and civics institutional partners and a small but mighty team bringing uh, varied strengths together to share relevant and compelling history as a tool for life. All of us can use those kinds of tools. So Carolyn will introduce the full slate of speakers. I will turn it over to her to do that. So thank you once again, Carolyn. I'm gonna sit back and enjoy the discussion and I will say goodbye to everybody at the end. Great, thank you, Noelle. So we have a great slate of speakers here today to talk about this critically important issue of disinformation. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers and then we'll get started in an interesting discussion. Uh, I know I have some questions for these panelists, and if you have questions, you can also use the chat function to share your questions there um, and send them to Carl, who, Carl Luna, who's on the panel, who's on the call. So thank you, Noel, for the great introduction, and thank you to the University of San Diego for having me here. Um, I am very pleased as the program manager for Made by Us to have two historians on this panel um, Stephanie Arduini is the American Civil War Museum's Deputy Director and the Director of the Edward Ayers Center for Civil War and Emancipation Studies. 
She has worked in a variety of museums over the last 18 years. Uh, and at the Civil War Museum, they, she works on projects that tell more complicated, inclusive and relevant stories of the Civil War and its legacies. We also have Louise Muir, who is the director of the New York Historical Society. Um, she is president and chief executive officer, excuse me, of the New York Historical Society. And she has authored four books and numerous articles in the humanities, including women, Muslims, and Jews in the texts of Reconquest Castile. She has been a professor in history and literature departments um, at many universities, in fact, and has served as an academic administrator for 20 plus years. And I'm very pleased to work with Louise closely on the Made by Us project and with Stephanie as well. We are also joined um, by two news directors. And as you know, this is a really important aspect of the conversation we'll have today. Matthew Hall is the editorial and opinion director at the San Diego Union Tribune, where he has worked since 2001. He manages the ideas and opinion section, writing and editing editorials and overseeing editorial cartoons, commentaries, letters to the editor, and a podcast called Name Drop San Diego. Previously, he managed the newsroom's social media, was a Metro columnist, and worked as a reporter covering San Diego politics and East and North San Diego County. Uh, in addition, we are joined here by Natalie Walsh, who is the executive producer of news for KPBS radio and television. As executive producer, Natalie oversees the local programming and operations, including the midday edition on radio, evening edition on TV, the round table on radio and TV, and local news in morning edition and all things considered, as well as special projects like election coverage. And she's been with KPBS since 1993. She launched the station's first nightly news program, Full Focus, and was senior producer of the long running daily radio talk show these days. So I know that both Natalie and Matthew will add a really useful dimension to our discussions today as we talk about the role that the media can play in, in combating or contributing to disinformation. We're also joined by some experts um, in both conflict resolution and the true side of, of conspiracy theories. And we are joined by Shay Rhodes, who is the statewide legal expert on Pennsylvania laws related to sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation. As the co-founder and director of the Institute to Address Commercial Sexual Exploitation at Villanova University, Mrs. Rhodes works with and on behalf of victims and survivors of commercial sexual exploitation and human trafficking. She provides administration services for the prevent for the Pennsylvania Alliance Against Trafficking in Humans, and she's a member of several anti-trafficking initiatives. She sits on the steering committee for World Without Exploitation. Prior to, to forming the CSE Institute, she served the Philadelphia community as an assistant district attorney for nearly 10 years. Um, so we'll have a lot to learn today from her broad and deep experience um, in some of the true sides of these conspiracies. So, Without further ado, we will dive into our conversation today. I am sure many of you are watching this panel because you feel that this is a critically important issue to talk about disinformation and misinformation with only a month to go until the election day. And in fact, the election is underway. We're in election season right now. Many people have already voted or are voting. It's a time that's really critical for us to be aware of the threats that disinformation can play, both to our democracy, but also to our society and everyday life. So I don't wanna to give too much airtime to any conspiracy theory, of course, but just to get us all on the same page and make sure that we're all um, talking about the same things, I did wanna point out one of the biggest use cases today that we have some experts who can, who can speak to. So you may have heard of QAnon, um, this is an untrue, but a growing conspiracy theory that there is a global ring of sex trafficking, Satan worshiping pedophiles embedded in everyday life and engaged in a battle against President Trump. It is untrue, um, but it has legs. And this is just one of many conspiracy theories or cases of, of misinformation that, that grows and carries over into everyday life. These rumors have spread about this one in particular on internet message boards um, and they carry over to 
marches and protests and social media, really every aspect of our lives. You may recall the Pizzagate controversy in 2016, uh, in which conspiracy theorists um, spread this untrue idea that Democratic politicians were running a trafficking ring out of a DC pizza restaurant. And ultimately, someone took it upon themselves to investigate and shot a rifle into the pizza place. So since then, that theory has really grown. We've seen the co-opting of the hashtag Save the Children, which is also the name of a real organization. And we've seen many, many regular citizens caught up in this falsehood in particular. But there are many other cases of misinformation and conspiracy spreading. And in the digital age and a hyper-polarized one, it can all seem quite overwhelming. So for the historians in the room, they may very well tell us that we've been here before. Um, so we're looking forward to this conversation. If you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat and we'll get started. We're gonna dig in with our experts to learn more about why this happens and what we might all do about it. So I wanna start with Shay here, who is an expert in the true story behind child trafficking. So Shay, what is the real story there? Um, and how do these conspiracy theories get started? Is there any truth to them at all? So that's what's really interesting about this. Um, and I'm excited to be here. So thank you for including me in this panel. Um, this is a really interesting conversation that those of us who spend all of our time um, in our day-to-day -day professional lives working on, um, including in the policy space, uh, working directly with survivors of trafficking. And, you know, I, I consult a lot now um, with ongoing prosecution cases. And I can tell you that what strikes me is really kind of not interesting, but strange about this is that combating human trafficking has actually never been a partisan issue, not ever. Um, it, you know, we have worked on legislation here in Pennsylvania at the federal level. I've, you know, worked on it in Nebraska, in Missouri, in Colorado, in all kinds of states. I have lots of, um, you know, partners in this movement and stakeholders in this movement nationally who work on it in California and Louisiana. And this has never, ever been um, about which political party you're in, you know, affiliated with. It is something that we have worked on both sides of the aisle, across, you know, across the aisle, and and really been able to push legislation forward to protect victims, to make the crimes stronger against perpetrators. Because sex trafficking, and specifically sex trafficking of children, is a very real crime. It is happening to our own children here in the U.S. That means U.S citizen children, the majority of children, at least in every single child that I have ever either represented or been engaged with when I was a prosecutor or, you know, um, talk to social workers about, consult on their cases, every single child survivor of sex trafficking that I've ever known was trafficked by someone that they know, not by a stranger, was not kidnapped on off the street. And so, what I find to be really interesting is that one, you said this directly, that this has legs now. And one of the reasons I think it's gotten legs and, and really started to run is because it feeds into preconceived ideas that people already have, um, whether it be from that, you know, really um, well-known movie Taken with Liam Neeson, right? Um, it's based on fiction in, in the movies. I'm gonna date myself here, right? Like, you know, prostitution is, is something that, you know, Julia Roberts was involved in and Richard Gere, you know, rescued her and saved her from. Um, and although that was, you know, a lovely movie that was 30 years ago, that's completely fiction. And it might as well have been a cartoon because it's, you know, it's a fairy tale. And the reality of the situation is that children are, again, our own US citizen children are being trafficked primarily by people that they know. 
um, and, and trusted. And the reason that they have become vulnerable to trafficking is because they, they have something um, that they need that hasn't been fulfilled, whether it be clothing or housing or shelter or a safe place to go. And someone has exploited that, that vulnerability in order, quite frankly, to make money trafficking them for, for the purposes of sex. And so the fact that this has you know, really gotten legs and run wild and is trying to become this partisan issue is really detracting from the reality of what child sex trafficking looks like. Um, it's silencing the very survivors themselves who have, you know, I've had lots of conversations with since July when this really started getting, um, you know, hitting mainstream social media. Um, people are, their, their own stories are being silenced as if they didn't even live their lives. And, and quite frankly, some of our concerns are that people who are still actively being victimized are going to see, well, I wasn't kidnapped in the parking lot from Walmart, or I wasn't sold, you know, as a piece of furniture by Wayfair, or I wasn't wearing a, a mask to protect myself from COVID. So I don't necessarily fit into these categories. So I guess I might not be a victim and that is, or, you know, and, and get out of the life. And that is really terrifying to us who do this work. So it, it's just, um, it's really unfortunate that QAnon has just run wild with this. And the fact that it, you know, some people are saying, well, it's getting attention. It's not getting the right attention. And if I were to give anybody advice on anything that they see that's over, you know, sensationalized is do your homework, right? Um, I was getting a lot of emails. Uh, there was you know, there have been these uh, law enforcement operations happening around the country where missing children who've been reported to NICMEC, which is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, have been recovered, which is amazing. And part of this QAnon um, conspiracy theory was that these 39, 39 children in Georgia were recovered from the back of a truck. Actually, 39 children were recovered during, a, you know, um, this operation being conducted in the state of Georgia. They weren't all in the back of the truck. The majority of those children were uh, recovered from someone who was a family member, right? Like, you know, um, maybe a divorce gone bad. A again, situations like that, but not from stranger kidnapping and definitely not in the back of the truck. So the way that I always advise people is look, go to the local media. That should have been like front page mainstream news, right? The New York Times, the Washington Post. Go to the local media in those jurisdictions to two sources that you really rely on and, and check around. And again, if people are citing to um, studies and there is no study linked, go to Google Scholar, right? Google.scholar.com and plug it in and look to see if there really is a study that's done. Just do your homework, think critically, and don't necessarily take something at face value. Absolutely. And thank you for that explanation. So one more follow-up question, and, and we'll get to some other points of view, and then I want to come back to you. Does the fact, you know, some conspiracy theories are just so separate from reality, and even some elements of this are so dramatic that it's, it seems like, how can people believe this is happening? Sure. But does it make your work harder that there are some elements elements of truth, um, how does your, how does it even affect the work that you do having to parse out what you're hearing from sort of rumors and sources? Because I imagine that in your work, some of what you do is just ear to the ground um, in terms of finding out what's going on. Sure. So, so like, here's a nugget of truth, right? Everybody knows that Jeffrey Epstein or, you know, who watches Netflix, because there's been documentaries on this, watches the news, has been reading about it, knows that Jeffrey Epstein was accused of child sex trafficking. He ultimately died before trial. And that very recently, um, someone who's accused of being his co-conspirator, Ghislaine Maxwell, um, is arrested and is awaiting trial on those same child sex trafficking charges. He has friends in high, powerful political positions um, who may or may not be, um, you know, leaders of the free world, right? Like he'd been alleged to have been uh, in the same rooms or on the same airplanes with Bill Clinton. Same thing with our current president. Um, you know, a, a law professor at, you know, Harvard represented him. He got a great deal uh, when he was originally accused uh, of 
not necessarily child trafficking, but related crimes of sexual violence in Florida and the our labor secretary, Acosta, had been the U.S. attorney. So there's like some things, right, that resonate as being a little bit true. But Jeffrey Epstein's case is, is kind of an anomaly. It doesn't mean that high-profiled people um, aren't involved. But one of the things that I think are people saying like that, that these are billionaires and it's this, you know, international sex trafficking ring. Yes, those do exist. But when we're talking about here in the U.S., the majority of cases of, of traffickers are not rich billionaire people with political connections and disposable income. There are individuals, um, you know, who, again, I'm gonna talk about some of the cases that I've seen in Pennsylvania. It's pimp controlled prostitution and they're selling children for sex. Those individuals are also sometimes accused of selling drugs. They're, they're, not, um, they're not high sensational, high profile people. Something else that's really interesting is, you know, that only really wealthy, politically connected individuals are buying sex, which is if you subscribe to the ideology like I do, those who purchase sex are what drive the market for trafficking to happen. And the reality of, and, and people are saying like, no one I know buys sex. The reality is, is you probably do know someone who buys sex because this is something that no one really talks about. It's underground, it's incredibly pervasive. And if you look at some of the data, again, I'm gonna talk about data and how it, it's hard to gather. And I think, you know, Amy can, can talk about data gathering much more than I can because she's done that whole empirical research study in San Diego. Mm -hmm. But the National John Suppression Initiative, which is run through the Cook County Sheriff's Office out of Chicago and has over 120 jurisdictions nationally, will tell us that the highest percentage of individuals who are buying sex are white, middle-aged, married, educated, and employed men. And that's pretty much, we all know someone who fits into those categories, right? So we really need to start thinking about why child sex trafficking exists, what's, you know, who's driving the market for, for it to exist, and who in reality is being victimized. And those are kids with vulnerabilities and quite frankly, girls who are of color, don't have a stable home, probably have a co-occurring substance use disorder to self-medicate from the pain and the trauma that they've suffered or uneducated and all of those things, not kids being kidnapped in the Walmart parking lot. It's a really good point. And I want to head to our news directors because just as you said, you know, certain things can occur more often in certain groups. Conspiracy theories, maybe also like, you know, we, we have, um, there's some evidence to say that conspiracy theories like these take root in some groups versus others. So I wanted to ask um, Matt here, how does fake news play into this? Like this, you know, conspiracy theory that is this one or others that have legs of their own that affect the real work um, being done by people like Shay. How does, we know how misinformation plays into that, but what is the role of the media today in combating that? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. It's an important question. I, I think you had to start with the foundation of how do you define media, right? Because there's conventional media outlets like Natalie and I work at, and then there's uh, what are really media outlets, but don't consider themselves media outlets such as Facebook and Google and Twitter. And we just saw, you mentioned QAnon, just yesterday, uh, Facebook banned QAnon content on their site, right? So they took it upon themselves to say across Facebook and Instagram, where um, that, org that, 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 that kind of theory uh, that conspiracy theory is taking root a little bit. They're trying to uproot it, um, you know, too little, too late, uh, maybe. But uh, to your to answer your question directly, you know, journalists need to do what we've always done, which is seek the truth and report it, right? So that's two different things. We have to get the, get the story, make sure it's accurate, and then get it into our outlet, whether that's radio or a podcast or or a newspaper, website, whatever, TV. Um, and so the course of that, we do what we've always done, but is increasingly difficult, which is verify your facts. It's the old adage, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out, right? Like, no offense, mom, if you're watching. Um, I, you know, but that's how seriously we take it. We, we gotta look, make sure that the facts are accurate. And then when we get them in our, our, our outlet, um, have a conversation about it. The job doesn't end when we publish, the job starts, right? Because social media uh, allows, the public to talk to us in real time. We need to take that seriously. This is a two-way conversation. I tell that to people all the time. This is not us coming down from the mountains with stone tablets. It's a two-way conversation. 
And if they have an issue or a problem, we need to say, okay, I'm listening. You got my attention. Oh, I made a mistake. Own the mistake, correct the mistake. And that's how news outlets uh, 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 kind of retain their credibility, retain their trustworthiness. Because the problem with fake news and conspiracy theories and hoaxes is that it's meant to undermine things, whether that's news institutions or um, elections. Voter suppression is a huge part of this, especially voter suppression of communities of color. Uh, you know, and so I think journalists need to be on guard about this. But and I'll just close with a real quick point. In 2016, you saw fact checking take place in uh, more than it ever had in real time. More people, more resources, uh, more posts about lying. And you know what? Hillary Clinton lied a little bit. Uh, Donald Trump lied a lot, and he still won. So I think in 2020, in this next four weeks, you're going to have to see journalists really confront this. And the dis the decision that news outlets have to make is how to confront um, falsehoods, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, uh, and how to get people to care. Because in 2016, some people clearly did not. So because you manage the, the social media page and you've um, brought that up as well, what it, is it? Is this a good thing that there's a two-way dialogue? I mean, news writers and editors have some expertise here and they employ fact checkers and there's a process, but in an age where everyone has their own microphone, I recently live streamed a mass and I couldn't believe the comments that were coming in. I thought, well, this is a first. Um, this is a, certainly new for Catholicism to open up a two-way dialogue. Um, is that a good thing that you're hearing back from people or does it just allow misinformation to spread? I think it's both. I think on balance, it's good. It's healthy. It allows, you know, whether you are a reporter at the New York Times or a citizen journalist in San Diego, you have the potential to, as you have, as you experienced, have your thing, whatever it is you're documenting, kind of get out into the world, right? So social media is the great equalizer in many, many ways. And it does allow journalists to do many things that they didn't. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I challenge journalists to think back pre-smartphone to what journalism was like. It is nothing like what it's like now for, for, for better and for ill. I mean, I tell my team all the time, you can get a Twitter fight with someone, spend that 10 minutes fighting with that, with that Twitter troll, or you can spend 10 minutes doing journalism, do the journalism, right? So we are allowed to, to mute trolls, to not listen to trolls, to keep them at arm's length, but that is, they have momentum and it's so easy for accounts to clone one another and to get that fake information out there. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying initially, uh, I'm curious to hear what Natalie has to say about this too, is you know, the, the, the responsibility on, among journalists is what it always has been, but I think the difference is, is that the repercussions are tremendous. Journalists lose their jobs. I saw a question in the chat about NBC uh, uh, publishing of what's called Fabricated Footnote 15. Google it if you don't know. Two journalists uh, were uh, suspended through the election, and when they come back, they will no longer be allowed to cover politics because they published what was a completely false um, report with this element, as I said, fabricated footnote 15. So the repercussions are real. You can lose your job, you can lose your credibility, your institution can be affected, uh, and it doesn't take very much for that to happen. So I think we all need to be on guard against that, news consumers and journalists alike. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to think what the repercussions for you know regular citizens spreading rumors could be. Um, Natalie, a question for you. How is your team handling this, especially in an election season when you see may see trolls or you may see competing stories, maybe they have, have untruths. What does news coverage look like in this election season? Well, I think, um, and you know, Matt alluded to this and I know our historians can talk about it. Um, uh, dirty politics is nothing new. It, it's always been around, it's happened. I think, um, this year, and, and I think it's probably pretty safe to say, um, since the 2016 election, it's it's elevated it to a level that I don't think any of us maybe were even really prepared for. Um, the amount of disinformation, so misinformation, you know, it's different than disinformation. Misinformation is you can get something wrong. There can be a rumor that started, and and the intent isn't to continue perpetrating something that's inaccurate. Misinform disinformation is, is, is done purposefully to, um, it, it's, the, it's the intentionality of spreading falsehoods. And that's what we're seeing on a scale that we probably all can agree we've never seen before. 
Um, the fact that the President of the United States does this on a fairly regular basis in his administration makes it really challenging for the journalists who are covering this. And then you, you multiply that by the citizenry who have to figure out what's real and what's not. Um, so I think it's a, it's a daily, for journalists, it can, sometimes it can feel like a daily grind. There's, because there is so much information out there and individual news organizations have, you know, if you will, you've got, you've got your staff, you've got a limited kind of pipeline of what you can actually um, cover and follow up on um, because we don't have endless resources. So it's, a, it's, it's really challenging. One thing that I wanted to note, e even in our newsroom in 2016, we had a conversation um, and, and Matt probably experienced this at the Union Tribune about um, whether you can say if somebody lied or not. And we, we had serious conversations about that with, with President Trump. Um, and it goes back to intent. And so for a long time, mainstream media organizations, conventional media organizations wouldn't say he lied because we didn't know what he was intending. What did he actually know in his head? Um, and he's very good at using this. Um, well, it may be true, it may not be true. We don't know, we're gonna see. Um, so, so he's got a, a, a way and a style of speaking which makes it really hard, made it for a long time hard. But this year, it almost seems like, um, you know, the New York Times will have in a headline, Trump lies. Um, you look back too, too long ago, that, that wasn't the case. And so it's, it's, it's like, I think our role is so important to be able to actually say to the, to the audience, um, this is not true. And then look at the intention behind why it's not true, if, if in fact it's a lie. Um, but for consumers, for, for the public, for news consumers, um, they have a difficult job to figure out where do you go to get verifiable information. So as, as a citizen and as a voter, you can make the best choices. It's, um, it's probably unlike anything we've ever seen before this election year. It's really interesting, and I almost can't wait to get to our historians, because when you talk about um, whether or not how to frame something, whether or not to say a person lied, these become sources that historians use later as well. And if you weren't there, whether you're in 2020 or 2050, and you weren't there at the moment, how do you know what happened? And how do you know what the truth was? Um, and so we can, we can come back. I do want to get to talking about um, some initiatives that may work to stem the tide. And maybe we'll do that towards the end of our conversation as we think about solutions. Um, but to jump over to our historians here, um, Louise, when we're thinking about the truth, as a historian, is there a truth? Um, and how can knowing how historians would approach this help us navigate this moment? First of all, let me say that um, listening, just listening in, which has been fascinating and, and wonderful and illuminating, I'm thinking about Alexander Hamilton, um, an easy, easy mark uh, today because um, his story has been so well popularized by the musical. But, um, you know, truly what is happening today is not much comfort, but what is happening happening today is um, the sort of thing that really led to his death in a duel uh, with Aaron Burr. And, you know, there was an exchange of very robust exchange of letters between um, the two men in, uh, in June of um, 1804 leading up to the duel. Um, you know, precisely the same sorts of accusations and um, fake news or untruths um, or uncertain truths, let's say. Uh, um, that could not otherwise be resolved or were seen as impossible to resolve other than um, by one man killing the other. So, uh, you know, cold comfort that, um, that we have a long history, uh, certainly in this country, we have a long history and a lot of, lot of it implicates the press as well in, um, uh, in trying, to, trying to establish the truth, but um, having plenty of protagonists whose who see their job as um, to the best of their ability, uh, um, veiling the truth, covering over the truth or inventing, um, fabricating uh, to their own political ends or to the political ends that they seek to support. Um, but I, getting past that, I mean, I think, um, 
You know, I think the job of the historian is really to look at the evidence. And the, the nice thing about uh, um, my job heading a museum, which happens to have a, uh, a historic collection, very, very deep, um, uh, robust historic collection stretching back to the 17th century, is that there is a lot of, um, of hard evidence uh, about things, documents that were signed by various people, treaties, um, real objects, uh, paintings. So, you know, if you invent the characteristics of, uh, let's say, a, um, a historical figure, um, and you find, I mean, obviously, one one painting is not going to solve the truth. But um, if you find a number of of uh, depictions of that historical figure that you know all characterize them the same way. Um, that is evidence, it's evidence. And uh, that's what we look for. And um, the, you know, the truly comforting thing is that people have come to rely on repositories of hard evidence as places where they actually can find the truth. And, uh, and that's extremely important. But I would say, you know, above all, um, if, you know, if we want to attempt in any way to get at the truth, um, we have to look for evidence that will be as objective as it can be. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's what museums like ours exist for, libraries like ours exist for. Absolutely, and, and studies show that museums are one of the most trusted sources of information. So do they have a role in combating misinformation as well? Um, when visitors come in, how do they know, if, if we're trusted as museums, how do they know what to expect from us? Well, um, you know, that's also another interesting question. Um, one um, activity that we're engaged in right now that you know about, Caroline, because uh, it's very much enmeshed in the work of Made by Us um, project you lead, uh, is, is to do rapid response, a kind of rapid response collecting. So for example, right now, we are very much engaged in two collecting efforts. One of them is around uh, the, the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, and its effects on our city and our nation. And the other is, um, is uh, around what has happened in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. So, um, uh, you know, we, we are collecting like mad because people will want to know what actually happened. You know, people 25 years from now, 50 years from now, will want to know what is it that actually happened, actually did happen. So we're collecting evidence at the moment. Now, um, to somebody who comes to our institution and wants to know, uh, for example, um, you know, what really happened, let's, let's take something fairly recent, but not that recent anymore, 9-11. Um, you know, someone wants to know what happened and there are, you know, conspiracy theories abound around 9-11. Um, that is a, a moment at which our institution also uh, went out and said historians are you know, agents of the truth. We must go out and collect, amass the evidence, and someone can come and look through it and, um, and, you know, and make decisions. So uh, I think that we serve, you know, we serve huge populations of people who are seeking the truth and um, who recognize that if they can comb through the effects of history, they can, they can get at it, they can get at the truth. Of course, you know, it's, um, it's, it's not as simple. That's, you know, it would be simplistic and, um, and glib to suggest that, uh, that history is truth. Um, it's not, but there is evidence and it's only, the only way to combat um, what is happening right now is, is really with evidence. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about all these historical organizations collecting more voices, more perspectives on what's happening right now. And, and news is happening so fast. Um, we're in news hyperinflation. I think I saw that in a tweet. News, more and more news every day, and it's worth less and less. But I wanted to ask you, um, Matt, while, while we're on the subject of news, as the editor of the opinion page, how are you inviting more voices in? And how does that compete with, you know, the straight news that you're trying to convey to people. And, and just to follow up on that even more, for young consumers of news who are also hearing voices from TikTok and Twitter. And I mean, I 
get information from all of those places. How can they understand what the value of the opinion page is? What's your, what's your role there? Yeah, I mean, I think media literacy is as important as it's ever been. Uh, I go into schools, sometimes uh, elementary school students, uh, and talk to them about the importance of that. I have two young uh, daughters of my own that I try to keep off TikTok as much as I, as much as possible. It's a losing, it's a losing endeavor. Um, but I think to your point about voices, that really is the that's the game in journalism. I don't mean I don't mean game like in a comp competitive way. I mean that's that's the point of journalism now. If you are not bringing voices in your community, your community is not going to trust you. We're, we're seeing that uh, on, a, on a macro level with the protests that have uh, swept across the nation uh, in the killing of George Floyd. You're seeing that in local stories here on the border where Latinos are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, so journalists, journal, journalism outlets that first of all have a staff that reflects their community are going to be trusted more. So this, just to start with here, the Union Tribune has uh, been sort of releasing our demographic data for our staff and management level. So readers, listeners, and viewers can go to our website and see um, what our demographics are on those two levels, management and staff, and what they have, what the change has been over two years. So our commitment to the community is we will update those figures so they can judge us as they see fit. And we're also bringing voices in, right? So for a long time, my uh, newspaper's history is that it's been, uh, the editorial board has been dominated by uh, older white men. Um, I've tried to diversify the board. Um, you know, so we have a Latina on it. There's two millennials who are women, one of whom happens to be mixed race. Uh, and so whose stories are being told is a big part of this. And with that in mind, you know, we don't have a lot of money for me to hire a, a hugely diverse uh, editorial board to tell, to have kind of a world, a different worldview. But what we can do and have done is reach out to people and have them write op-eds for us. We have a community uh, advisory uh, board that's 15 people from around the community, varying by all sorts of different, um, uh, 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 you know, gender uh, demographics, uh, uh, diversity for race, race and ethnicity, geographic, age, politics, et cetera. And those 15 or so people meet with us regularly, give us line of sight in the community, criticize us, hold us accountable. We also have 60 people who are Community Voices Project. Again, uh, a multitude of voices. And they write essays on anything they want at any length, at any time. One of the problems with newspapers is here's your box. And if you've written something in this box, sorry, you have to wait three months to fill that box again. So that's, that's not a good way to, to start a community conversation. I mean, it's done for a reason because you wanna have many voices, but there's limited space in a newspaper in the way there's not online. And so what we've done is we've reached out to the community and we've asked them write for us on anything and we'll publish it. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're standards. We wanna make sure that they're not libeling anyone, that their facts are accurate, but they can write on any subject they want. Uh, and it's been really uh, great to see. The response has been fantastic. And I think to your original question, you know, having many voices right now, and, you know, it's great that I've followed uh, uh, Luis, who made the point about history being voices, right? We've all, I'm sure we've all seen Hamilton now. It's on Disney Plus. It's streaming. If you haven't, you should totally watch it. It's an amazing piece of theater. I was lucky enough to see it in person in New York um, for the world's tilted. Um, but, you know, who, who, who tells your story? That's the fundamental point of Hamilton, it's the fundamental point of news and of history. Uh, and so you, everyone here has really hit the nail on the head, more voices, better. More voices. And still we, you know, we do have this problem of not everyone's an expert, not everyone maybe it's checking their facts, but the more perspectives we can invite in, that seems to be the way to go. I now have a question. I'm gonna build on a question we got from the audience. Um, and this is gonna go to Natalie and then Stephanie for an interesting civil war perspective. Um, why does modern journalism have to use such hyperbolic language and sensationalism in news coverage? And while I don't think we have to, uh, the question as to, are we seeing more of this now? And that, so Natalie, let's hear from you. And then Stephanie, you know, same question. How does, how did this happen in the past? Um, well, I would probably take issue with my own news organization doing that. Um, but, uh, and it, it's actually interesting, um, uh, Part of it might be it's there is there are so many avenues for people to get news and information, which we've all talked about. It, it is kind of mind-boggling where you can go to find anything you want. Um, so part of it might be if you're you're 
competing. You know, I, I work for a TV and radio station as well as digital platform. We talk about eye, eyeballs and ears, and um, and then you know, tr traditionally you you want as many eyeballs and in ears on your story as possible, um, because kind of if if you if you if you write or read or produce a story, nobody hears it or sees it, then what's the point? So that's just kind of human nature about media. You want as many people to see your work, to read your work, to hear your work. Um, so it could be that that the sensationalization is, it's just that competition. Um, in our own newsroom, we talk about that even digitally for headlines. How do you, um, uh, that's the nature of, of the digital platform and the way headlines, the, the search engine optimization of headlines. So we, we talk about that in our newsroom, but we also try to be um, mindful of not, not kind of stepping over a line of, of making a headline misleading or sensational versus capturing somebody's interest so that they click on your story and read your story. Um, it's unfortunately, I think it's the nature of, of, of just where media has gone um, and it's the responsibility of journalists um, to make sure they're not they're not doing that at the expense of adding to the uh, the divisiveness and the sensationalization of the, that's just already out there. The chaos the chaos is there. We don't have to add to it. So it's being very mindful and, and kind of going back to the the roots of journalism that you know Matt talked about. It's it's speaking the truth. It's 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 finding the truth and then telling it. Um, for the audience. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Stephanie, hyperbolic language. Is this new? Have we ever seen this before? Can't imagine a worse divide, except maybe the Civil War. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> this kind of hyperbolic language is not necessarily new. And as Louise was saying, it's not even unique to the Civil War. It's something that humans tend to do and tend to respond to. Before the Civil War, it was definitely there. Uh, there had been long simmering tensions, especially around slavery and the role of slavery and future of slavery in the country. And as tensions rose, you saw things like Charles Sumner getting caned on the floor of the Senate, it, like tensions rising and having violent outbursts or confirming fears and confirming pre-existing ideas. I think that was something I heard Shay say before, having these larger theories pivot off of things that were already existing in people's heads. But coming into the election of 1860 that elected Abraham Lincoln, he was the face of a almost brand new political party. And it was one that especially white elite Southerners and enslavers saw as really, really threatening to their way of life. And a lot of the language that they were using in their newspapers were colorful, bombastic, um, language describing Republicans in general, Abraham Lincoln, others in his party as being painting the picture that if you elect him, here's the world that we will face. It'll be incredibly violent. There'll be John Browns everywhere leading massive uprisings of the enslaved people. So lock your doors. Your life is in danger if you elect Abraham Lincoln. Not saying that conservative white Southerners were really behind everything, but they're a very colorful example of the incredibly partisan language coming into the Civil War, especially when newspapers were often directly connected to political parties, or you would get your news from the political party that you affiliated with. And people were getting that news in a way that fed their pre-existing beliefs. And it was sometimes hard, especially in the South, to get information that contradicted that. It's really interesting. Um, and speaking to what you just said, I mean, I feel like we're still fighting the Civil War. The aftermath just will, you know, is, goes on and on and on, um, not only in the news and the way we consume it, but um, the actual stories of the Civil War. And for those of you listening, if you don't know, the American Civil War Museum is an amazingly successful merger of the Civil War Museum in Richmond, in Richmond and the uh, Confederate Museum. Is that right, Stephanie? Yep, so we came about from a merger of the Museum of the Confederacy and the American Civil War Center, two very different organizations to create this new one. 
But you're right. It, we see this a lot of people coming in with a variety of ideas and understandings of the Civil War and wrestling with that. One thing I'll say is that we can talk about partisan divides and divisiveness going into the Civil War, but one of the things we spend a lot of our time with discussing with our visitors is what came after the Civil War. So how people chose to remember that history and that experience because there came multiple threads of memory and scholars labeled many of them, one of the most popular or most well-known and most effective was something called the Lost Cause, which was especially defined and called that by former Confederates themselves, but a way that downplayed the role of slavery as essential to the cause of the war. It simplified and flattened in some ways contradicted its own narrative by saying um, the soldiers were they they had a um, they were valorous, I should say that. And Robert E. Lee in particular was, was the most virtuous and bravest of all of those soldiers. It erased African Americans from the narrative, except when they were subservient. It said women were pure and saintly. And so it complicated people's actual understandings, but they were doing this, especially as a way to make a statement about the values that they held and about their vision for the future. And they were deliberate and their advocates were deliberate in enshrining this narrative into things like public policy, into state standards and textbooks, into the commemorative landscape. Um, and not saying that this is all ex-Confederates because there were some who did not subscribe to this ideology, but it was a narrative that elite white Southerners, especially ex-Confederates over generations ingrained into the world into a way that that's kind of how most people in some way, shape or form, they have gotten seasonings of the lost cause in their education. And that conflicts with things that they're hearing from scholars. And it's a hard thing that people have been wanting to unpack. And so we've been having to wrestle with like what caused the Civil War? Um, what do these monuments mean? How do I wrestle with what these mean to me and my community? But I'm hearing people tell me that that's wrong. What do I do with this information? So it's not necessarily, and in some ways it kind of was deliberate misinformation and conspiracies, but in other ways, it's just the product and evolution of a form of narrative that was effectively instated and evolved over time. Yeah, well said. I mean, it really does go back to what is the truth? What's the evidence for the truth? And who's telling the story? And who was left out of telling the story? And I think for all of us today, we have a role to play. Uh, if there's one takeaway here, we all play a role for better or for worse. So I want to move in the last 15 minutes here to some solutions or at least approaching things we can do to combat misinformation um, and to understand that there's a lot of, no matter what, there's always a choice. There's always kind of an editorial selection that's made in the news we read, in the history we collect and tell. Um, and while we have experts to do these things, each of us also needs to be a, a critical consumer. Um, so I'm interested to hear from you, Shay, a little bit about the campaign that your work has put together called Trafficking Truths. And the really interesting thing to me about this is it's hashtag trafficking truths. And so that's a campaign that takes place on social media in the same place that these rumors are spreading. So was that intentional and is, has that been a problem or has that actually been the best place to be? Can you tell us more? So yes, it was very intentional. And what we did starting in July, um, I, I have to fully admit, I, I do consume a lot of my news on social media, but I have never had a Facebook page. And I kind of have a personal rule. If I'm not friends with you in real life, I don't want to be friends with you on the internet. With that said, you know, I do have a Twitter feed. My institute here at Villanova Law does have a Facebook page. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm housed inside of a law school where we have young students, you know, the millennials are almost done with law school unless they're a non-traditional student. And now we have Gen Z here and they speak a very fluent social media language. So in July, um, the young attorneys who uh, work for me along with my research assistants and some of my students were coming to me saying, 
um, social media is running wild and has lost their mind. And I, you know, I was like, what? And they said, go into your Twitter feed or into your Instagram account and look at the hashtag save the children, which was almost immediately pulled. And then it turned into the hashtag save our children. And at the same time, I started getting emails from stakeholders in Pennsylvania who were like, what do you think about Wayfair? Do you think Wayfair is really selling kids? And I was like, um, no, I just bought a light in my front hallway from Wayfair. Um, and so I, I started reaching out to some of our national counterparts. Um, you know, I work with survivors all over the US who run their own organizations. Um, I am on the executive committee of World Without Exploitation. We have survivors on our executive committee. Um, I have a symposium every year that is built around the voices of survivors who quite frankly, it's their lived experiences that you know, give me value to what I do. Um, there's no way I could advocate for a lot of change without having said to a survivor, how would you want this? How would have, if this had impacted you? And so I reached out to a couple and they said that uh, Rebecca Bender at the Rebecca Bender Initiative out of Oregon was putting together a campaign. And I said, I will amplify her campaign to tell me what to do. So in August, we all got on a Zoom call and Rebecca put together a toolkit that you can get on her website, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we did it deliberately with the hashtag trafficking truths, reality check, the hashtag reality check it. And we were tying our um, I don't know how social media algorithms work, but like if you think save hashtag save our children is, you know, you should really check out. So we were trying to like push our hashtag into the save our save our children hashtag to debunk these conspiracy theories that were out there and have people actually be like, oh wow, um, maybe I should read more. Again, I don't know how these algorithms work, but um I, I was listening to, you know, Rebecca and her team and there's a survivor at the Avery Center in Northern Colorado named Megan Lundstrom, and she works with a sociology professor. And, you know, Megan is really into data collection and um, social media, which is listening to them on, on how, to, how to go about this. So what's also interesting is on my personal Instagram account, I follow a lot of happy things like cute kittens and sunsets and um, people who like to work out. And some of them are influencers or, you know, Instagram influencers. And I started noticing, wow, they have also glommed on to this Save Our Children hashtag. And so I started realizing how pervasive this really was when you have really high profile Instagram influencers or, you know, talking about things other than like the seltzer water that they're drinking, right? Um, and it was very concerning. So one of the myths that I think is so critical that we were seeking to debunk along with, you know, and spread through this hashtag trafficking truths is that sensationalism helps raise awareness. You know, I've been a practicing lawyer for almost 25 years. And one of the things that I think is so critical for lawyers, and I'm sure for journalists, as well as historians is our language choice. And I'm always telling my law students, and especially when you're looking to like rewrite legislation or amend the laws that we have, word choice matters. What does it mean? And how, how do we ensure that that is the best, clearest, most concise, precise language that we can use? And so sensationalism doesn't help to raise awareness. And I'm gonna read a quote to you from Rebecca's toolkit that she got from a survivor leader and advocate named Lexi Smith. When we're looking for the sensational movie scene, the child in class with your child, the kid in your youth group is going unseen. And that's dangerous and that's a problem. And the other piece of this, which is related to language is this rescue rhetoric. I am an attorney. I'm in the business of solving legal problems. The clients that we represent are all survivors of sex trafficking adults. It is not about me and I do not save them. Saving is something that comes along with the work that you do internally. And I think anybody who's working in a professional capacity with survivors of sex trafficking, who is saying that they're rescuing someone 
is sensationalizing and devaluing the lived experience of that survivor. And that's who really matters more than any of us, whether you're a social worker, a physician, a nurse, a journalist, a historian, it's the lived experience. Their truth is what matters. And we have to listen to that. We have to pay attention to that. And when you have the Polaris Project having to take time out of running the National Human Trafficking Hotline mm -hmm. to say to people, cut this out because our hotline is ringing off the, the hook. And that's taking away from people who are being victimized trying to call the hotline to get out, to get help. Others who are seeing actual trafficking situations, it's just getting in the way. And there's so much work to be done. And that kid who might be in class with your kid or who might be in the youth group, that's the kids that we need to look at because they're in our community every day. That's what's important. It's a really great reminder. Thank you, Shay. And I have to say, speaking you know, about the lived experience is definitely something that in museums and for historians that comes up all the time. You know, We are not our audience for starters, and it's probably true for the journalists as well. Um, one person doesn't have the same experience as another person. Um, so we have this question from the audience. It's said that history is written by the winners. Are our current battles over misinformation, fake news, and conspiracy theories an effort by different groups to gain power by taking control of the historical narrative? So Stephanie, I wanted to ask you, you know, as I'm sure you have so many voices in the collection at the museum and you hear from the lived experience of people who fought in the Civil War and maybe it doesn't match up with the narratives that the winners can always um, cite. So do you see this as, in your experience and the Civil War and, and ever since, is this an effort by different groups to gain power? Is it something that just naturally happens? Can we do anything about it? What, what take us there? What should we do? So for the Civil War, the United States won the war, the Confederacy won the narrative afterwards. I mean, that's just kind of how it was. Um, the conversation and the narrative of lived experiences of people during the war itself are complicated and multifaceted and don't fit into the economies that we often condense things into to fit into a textbook or to fit into a, a movie for 90 minutes trying to explore these things. So when we look at the evidence that we see in primary sources and the archeological record, uh, all of those types of things, they represent stories that don't fit the narratives that people crafted, but people were crafting narratives for actual application about their present and their vision for the future. So narratives and memory are more about what people are saying in that moment that they were created and their vision for what was coming next. History tries to understand and make sense of what actually happened. But as we ask new questions inspired by conversations and issues that we're facing in our current world, we ask new questions about the past as new people get into the profession who have different experiences, especially people of color, women whose voices hadn't been prioritized in that history, they ask new questions. So it's normal for our understanding of the past to evolve. It's normal to lean into these types of contradictions. How do you make sense of people like George Washington who enslaved people and also saying and standing for amazing things for our country. How do we represent these two different ideas of freedom? And that's human nature. That's not how we like to tell stories, but I think that's important for us to wrestle with. And especially as we're thinking about how we use the past to make claims on our present, try recognizing that it'll be better for us to get away from narratives of untouchable icons and heroes, but rather complicated, multidimensional, imperfect people who can still achieve amazing things, but are still susceptible to also some really bad decisions or things that in the future, future generations will see as, what in the heck were you people thinking? That was a terrible choice. Why didn't you do something in this moment? Why didn't you demand change and make your voice heard? So thinking about the way that we frame people of the past, but also how we deploy historical narratives to the present is a critical skill that I encourage us all to get better at. 
Thanks. And to your point about skills, let's, I'm going to close this before I hand it over to um, Noelle to wrap us up. Louise and Matthew and Natalie, a question. If you could give us all a question that will help us be better consumers of the news, the current day news and history, what are some questions we can ask ourselves as we're hearing about the past or even the present? Help us out. Let me start with you, Louise. Well, I think, uh, you know, um, just listening to Stephanie's response, um, you know, history may be written, but um, history is heard as well. And I think going back to the voices we've been, been focusing on, um, you know, the voices we tend to hear are those of decision makers and opinion leaders. And I think what historians have, uh, have tried to focus on more, more recently, certainly over the last decade, um, is, uh, is uncovering the voices of people who were not likely to be decision makers or opinion leaders. So, you know, I would, I would interrogate those voices uh, more thoroughly, more carefully to get a more robust picture of, uh, of what reality um, might have been and what we can learn from the past. I think there's uh, something else as well that I, I just want to insinuate here, and that is that history gives us agency. Um, and I think, you know, Made by Us is a perfect example of, uh, of an effort to try to, to try to get younger generations um, to become more knowledgeable about the past. So, so they have the tools, they have, they have the evidence, they have the, uh, the knowledge that will really allow them to have an impact on their present and their future. And uh, you know that just may all sound um, fluffy, but um, but honestly, you know it is not. Um, history really does give you a kind of agency that um, that you can't easily get from uh, operating only in the present day and um, and as you know everyone has said in an environment which surrounds us with uh, you know with untruths. Well said. I mean, context is king, as we say. And if you don't know what happened before or what's happening now, it's really hard to absorb news and information in a vacuum. Um, Matt, what do you have to share with us that could help us be more critical consumers of information? Um, I, mean, I, I guess there's plenty of things on, on a base level people should be asking themselves as they consume news. Uh, who owns the outlets that you're reading? Uh, what what this sounds silly, but what date was the story published? People repurpose decades old content all the time. Uh, check the URL, cbs.com.co is not cbs.com. It's a fake site in Columbia. Um, but I would say generally speaking, um, broadly, you know, it kind of comes back to this overarching discussion we're having here and the point of it, of having multiple voices. Like, are you hearing from all the voices that you should be hearing from? And that means if you are a liberal or a conservative, don't just stay in your bubble read um, voices outside of uh, kind of how you see the world that is a healthy thing it'll help you expand your worldview and you know maybe we'll have discussions and solve things politically as a as a as a side note which is a good thing but also um, you know as you're asking yourself whose voices are missing I think the point here I'm, is I love that historians were included in this conversation because you know the last year, the U.N. Music Union has, 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 on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, has gone back and told uh, stories of women that, who, who didn't get the publicity that they had. So history is an important point. History doesn't end. Similar to journalism now is a two-way conversation. History is a two-way conversation, too. So you can find, uh, uplift, and amplify voices that should have been a part of this from the beginning, but weren't for one reason or another. Excellent. Thank you. Natalie, close us out. What can we all do to combat this disinformation and be better consumers? Uh, it's a hard. It's a hard question. I think for for our citizens to figure out sort of how to wade through it all because it is constant. You know, somebody who works in in news, and I've got my my screen up here with all my tabs of you know what I'm checking um, throughout the day to to figure out what's going on. Um, but there are a lot, and, and maybe I'm just a little bit more aware of it this year, um, but there, there are a lot of, of um, fact check um, uh, uh, sites out there, um, uh, internet search providers, it, you know, you can, you can go to your search provider and just put in, you know, 
uh, fact checking sites, good fact checking sites, look them up, find, find places, um, as Matt said, you know, find some reputable and journalism organizations, uh, the Pointer Institute, um, the Annenberg School at USC, that have fact check sites that, so that you can you can check a story and find out if it's you know if it's real or not. Um, and Google has that ability now as well. You can you can it's called Fact Check Explorer. You can put us you can just put a few keywords in and see if it's true. You know, uh, yesterday uh, the president tweeted that uh, the flu kills more people than COVID. Um, Facebook took that down. Why? Because it was, it is uh, dangerous to the health of our citizens. It's not true, number one, and, and it was a health concern. So there, and you can easily find that. So there is, there is so much out there that is not true. Um, and unfortunately, the onus is on the media consumer to sort of wade through it. Um, but there are a lot of, of things out there that you can look at. The debate tonight, it's going to, the vice presidential debate will be fact checked. In real time, you can go th to places like the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, whatever your your media organization is that you um, that you trust, and you can see what is actually being said and you know what grain of truth there is, or is it a big Pinocchio or not? So um, it's hard. I granted it, it's hard, um, absolutely. For but it's also so important if we want a, a truly informed citizenry to help us. Um, get through um, uh, the next, you know, the next few years. Thank you. And I just wanted to add one thought to what you all are saying. Um, one of my colleagues always brings up this billboard she saw that says, you're not in traffic, you are traffic. So this climate of misinformation, in some ways, there's some factors outside of our individual control, definitely. But as much as much as it's happening to us, we are a part of shaping it. So something we say it made by us is, you know, history and democracy are not fixed entities. They're not a given. They're living things that we all have a role in shaping. So I think just to leave people with that um, and to touch on all the great points that you experts have made, um, remember that you have a role to play and we look forward to um, sharing this follow-up and I will turn it over to Noelle and thanks to all of our great panelists for their thoughts. Hi, this has been a really great pa panel. I want to thank all of the panelists, um, Carolyn, uh, Shay, Matt, Louise, Stephanie, Natalie. I mean, this was really great. And thanks to Carl Luna who put this all together. Uh, it's a fascinating and important panel. Um, it's just by starting identifying the problems, just laying them all out, but then going through the history, this is important for all of us to do, and then considering solutions. These are the kind of conversations we need to be having all the time. And I have been um, happy to be a part of it. I'm kind of like Matt just said, is getting out of our bubble. Um, just as a little tiny side story, a number of USD students went back and um, to DC as we do in, um, in winter, when we were able to do that kind of thing. And to, uh, they went to the pizza parlor where the where Pizzagate had been, I forget the name of the place. I, I wasn't part of that team, but it was a huge group of 40 students who were there. And the phone was ringing off the hook. And the pizza owner just said to, to our group of students, uh, hello, um, do you wanna answer this phone? So our students picked up the phone and they had screaming, angry people saying, we know that you've got um, sex traffickers. We know you've got children hidden in there. Our students were absolutely mortified to, to hit it full on live. And I think um, a panel is good, but I think we need to be aware and watch out at the same time um, for when we see it ourselves. Okay. Um, if you liked this panel, do head off to the voting 2020. And I, I know that you go to san diego.edu slash events to sign up. But I'm going to invite you, just one little plug. Um, the Humanity Center has many USD conversations. We host panels like this on important topics that affect humanity and the future of the human condition, um, very much like this. Uh, we are also hosting um, a series on Tuesdays at 4. Uh, there are a few more of them left on environmentalism and care for our common home. Uh, there will be one next Tuesday. Uh, we have authors. Uh, our next author coming October 29th, and it will be virtual is Mark Daneleski, and he's here, um, and will be. It will also be streamed 
live so you can catch it on YouTube. And then we think we, we have Noam Chomsky coming in the spring and we're really excited about that um, in March. So stay tuned. Uh, and again, thank you uh, to everybody. It's been lovely spending uh, an afternoon with you.